The following is a conversation with Josh Barnett, one of the greatest fighters and submission wrestlers in history, with an epic 25-year career that includes being the UFC heavyweight champion and countless other accolades. He also happens to be one of the most intelligent and brutally honest human beings in all of martial arts, and especially so about his appreciation of and fascination with violence. Quick mention of our sponsors, which feels ridiculous to say after that introduction. Monk Pack Low Carb Snacks, Element Electrolyte Drinks, Eight Sleep Self-Cooling Mattress, and Rev Transcription and Captioning Service. Click the sponsor links to get a discount and to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that I've been a fan of Josh Barnett for a long time. This conversation was indeed a long time coming, and I'm sure we'll talk many times again. For what it's worth, I'm a student of combat sports and admire when they're done at the highest level, either through masterful execution of skill or relentless dominance of pure guts. For context, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu and have competed in wrestling, submission grappling, jiu-jitsu, judo, and even catch wrestling, which is a variant of submission grappling that Josh is one of the great practitioners, scholars, and teachers of. I could probably talk for hours about what I've learned from my time on the mat, but if I were to say one thing, it is that the mat is honest. You can't run away from yourself when you step on the mat. It reveals your fears, the lies you might tell yourself, all the delusions you might have, or at least I had, that there's anything in this world that can be achieved except through blood, sweat, and tears. That honesty, taken to the highest levels, as is the case with Josh, creates the most special of human beings and definitely someone who is fascinating to talk to. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, here's my conversation with Josh Barnett. Who were the philosophers and philosophical ideas that influenced you the most? Are we just jumping right in? That's we're it. right in, we're not, into no, the no, deepest. No foreplay on camera, all right. <laughs> I had an interesting philosophical journey, at least I think it's interesting, and that was, I think, as far as organized philosophy or maybe uh, authentic is not the right word, but like, uh, yeah, we'll say organized. Um, I would say that Nietzsche is probably one of the people with the most influence on on me, uh, but I also feel like, to a degree, your personality uh, will oftentimes dictate what philosophers that you Connect can you can you. vibe with. Yeah. So what what, what ideas from Nietzsche was it uh, the Ubermensch? Definitely the Ubermensch is, is huge to me because I see it as an extension of basically the religious concepts of God and higher ideals, but just put into a different uh, a secular context. And the idea also that um, the Ubermensch is striving and overcoming, you know, something that you're always working towards that very few will ever, it, it's not like the, the concept that you can just make them. It doesn't happen that way. It, and it's not based simply upon if you were say put through a genetic program and, uh, and, and turned into a super soldier, like I wouldn't, that wouldn't make it, you know, that's like the, the, the very, surface level and incorrect understanding of what the ubermensch is the ubermensch is the idea of this this kind of uh, human that that transcends all the the weaker lower aspects of humans which we're full of but i also think that there's an element in nietzsche's writing that suggests that it's not something you can even be in all the time like it's mm -hmm. even a temporary state because it's not something that we're capable of maintaining it's something to strive for like a morality uh, an image, the ideal, a set mm -hmm. of principles that we can connect to that doesn't rely on otherworldly kind of uh, out there things. Yeah, it's deeply and human. With, with Nietzsche, I feel like the concept of the Ubermensch um, is something built on authenticity as well. As Heidegger would say, like Dasein, right? So when you are authentic, and Heidegger being a, a follower of Nietzsche's and highly influenced by him, uh, with I think that the Ubermensch is an example of authenticity in that it isn't about trying to be anything that you cannot be or to go against who you are, but to actually understand that, accept that, and then work with what you can work with and, and, and create from your 
lump of clay that is you because I can't become certain. There's certain things that are just not going to happen for me because it's not in my proclivity. I mean, I'm never going to be, you know, five foot tall and 120 pounds. I mean that again, <laughs> I guess, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I know, but as you get more in tune with who you are, as you start learning more about what unique things, or at least what that, that combination that makes you that gestalt part of yourself, what those things are and how you can use them, then, you know, you can work towards being that old, taking what that is and seeing if you can get to that point. Now, the likelihood is no, maybe probably never. I mean, but we can never achieve godhood yet. You know, religion is, is, is a constant, you know, striving and a look at a higher ideal concept, even if it's multiple gods or one God, it's still essentially all built around this concept. Like I, I, I like the idea of uh, Catholics original sin. If you think of sin, not as evil, but as, you know, missing the mark, the archer's term where it derives, or even like in Spanish, you know, without. So as being, if you accept that you are imperfect, if you accept that you you need to constantly strive even against yourself, mm -hmm. because you, you will figure out the best ways at which to submarine your own capabilities, submarine your own dreams and wishes and whatever, you will ruin them more than anything else. And you will tell yourself that you ruined them on purpose for a good reason, or you'll say that you'll figure out a way to, to put it on everything else but yourself. And so the idea of thinking of, well, as I'm starting off on this whole thing, I got a lot of work to do and that's just the way it is. And I got to figure out what areas those are going to be. And so, you know, I thought, oh yeah, if I think of original sin actually can be, oh, that can be kind of a, a clever idea, but it's also just accepting that we're all uniquely strange and unequal in our own ways, but we have well, to figure out how that fits in. The word... Uh authenticity kind of connects to all of that. So striving to be your authentic self means figuring out exactly the shape of the flaws, the the, the character of your like little demons that you get to play with and around them finding a path to whatever the hell uh, ideal versions of yourself you can carve and pretending like that's such a thing is even possible. The other idea about Nietzsche is uh, on his idea of morality, he presents the argument that uh, morality is a human illusion and that uh, you know, there's not such a thing as good and evil, and these are all kind of constructs. Do you think there's such a thing as uh, good and evil that's connected to some objective reality? I think that there are some, I actually do believe that there are some universals. I'm not Kantian in any way, but I do think that there are some universals. And the thing that actually brought me to even the concept of that was Jung. So you know, Jung's concept of the collective unconsciousness, and then taking that thought and then applying it to looking through his history and uh, the most varied history you can find. Uh, so I would say probably religion is your earliest one to, that you can get for, for written history or uh, written examples of human behavior and psychology at, its, at, at the, the furthest that we can look into it uh, with, you know, from man's hand to whatever the medium is, cuneiform or whatever. But as you do that, and then let's say going from Mesopotamia to India to you know Europe to, and just going from all these places as disparate as they may seem, as many different cultures and ethnicities and religions and how the religions will, will vary quite a bit from monotheist to you know, uh, mono, uh, polytheist and so on and so forth. But then just seeing how there's all the through lines. And of course, Campbell, he did this uh, much earlier than, than than me thinking about it. But uh, I think that by l looking at things that way and starting to find the threads instead of always just looking at everything as being its own compartmentalized concept, as if it only applies to this time, this people, like getting overly POMO about it is just a really idiotic one. Postmodern. So you, you think that there is a, just like Joseph Campbell, there's a thread that connects all of these stories, narratives that we construct for ourselves as we evolve. And that thread is grounded in some kind of absolute ideas of maybe on the morality side, which is the trickiest one of good and evil. Somewhat, yeah. I think that a lot of this stuff is just derived from a biological perspective. I feel like these things are in, innate within us. Do like, you think our innately humans are good? Like we- No. <laughs> I don't. I feel like, I also feel like there's the issue of scale too. Like, 
Um, like Nassim Taleb likes to talk about how he views his, the way he interacts with, with groups in terms of scale. You know, what is this thing about like at a, at the familial level, I'm a, I'm a communist. And then at the, the civic level, I'm a, I'm a Republican or something. And at this other level, I'm a, and then it goes on at the widest level, he's a libertarian or something of that nature, you know, like fundamentally human interaction changes on scale, on scale and scale. And also, uh, from, uh, you know, subjective to the environment around them. So, and I don't even mean environment just in the sake of physical environment, uh, nature, right? Like nature is constantly trying to murder you. Well, it's not really trying. It's just nature's being nature. <laughs> yeah. The universe is the universe. And, uh, at times it takes you out. It yeah. just not with any particular, uh, compunction or prejudice. It just, oops, you know, oh, sorry, there's no more dodos. Uh, my bad. You know, but don't you think the particular flavor of the complexity that is the human mind was created? Like, let me make an argument for that pe all people are fundamentally good. <laughs> okay. Is uh, there's an evolutionary advantage to being, to striving to uh, cooperate, mm -hmm. to add more love to the world mm -hmm. of like compassion, empathy, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And that the very thing that created the human mind was this evolutionary advantage whatever the forces behind mm -hmm. this evolutionary advantage and At scale yes so <laughs> when we're dealing with a small tribe sure yeah when you meet another tribe maybe there's other factors that are going into that let's say you scale up and so your 150 has exceeded their 150 and like you start yeah. to get to a certain point where um you can't really be close enough to someone down the line of some of, of that next like that 150s 150 150 150 and they just now all of a sudden become some some guy whatever and when it comes to some guy at once it starts hitting scale i don't know that it's capable I, people can be as as magnanimous to the, a stranger as to the known if they orient themselves to be secure enough because it, it does come to security insecurity in one way or the other either brought on by the unknown brought on by an actual threat brought on by even their own as we would use the word insecurity in that their own insecurity within their own capabilities their own belief in themselves all these things um can change things from being compassionate and what have you to at least at the very least maybe not evil but self-interest driven to the point of a negative results for those that aren't you know what i mean right but another way to frame that is uh maybe it's less about scale and more about the amount of resources available so if we're overflowing with resources in terms of uh security and safety all the th uh things you've mentioned if we have more than enough resources then the way we treat a stranger the way we position ourselves mm -hmm. towards that stranger might be in a way that uh, allows us to be our real human selves as opposed to sort of our animal self. And therefore it's mostly about how clever can we descendants of apes be in coming up with all cool kinds of technologies and ways to uh, efficiently use the resources we have such that we're not constrained. And my hope is that we can, that human innovation mm -hmm. will outpace the growth of our the number of people that are starving for resources yes uh, i think that there's a lot of uh rationality behind uh this argument and you know, in, in some ways i agree and, and a lo in a lot of ways i see it as missing the point of of, of how this experiment has, has been playing out across time when you look at uh what re what for one it's like define resources you know what is a what is a, a resource of of as humans uh would would define it right or wealth even and so you can say well you know an iphone's a resource the internet's a resource uh water obviously is a resource but if we weigh them what is more important to human beings water internet or iphones it's water right so if we look at resources if we start with what do human beings need to live i mean actually live not live here in this bullshit fantasy 
creation extension of our own ingenuity and, you know, a prison of our own creation and also a paradise of our own creation. But this is not how human beings normally live. This is all built upon stuff on, on, uh, this is built on concept, on idea, and some, and, and some of it's built on just, well, this is the paradigm, so this is what you do. Human beings need food, they need water to survive, they need shelter from the elements, mm -hmm. and they need certain skills to perpetuate these things and be able to pass them down so that they can, so that these things don't become, uh, you don't end up in this, this gap where you have to relearn things, because if, if, if it's lost, then th that time before you can get it back again is going to be a, a dark ages of sorts, you know, or it's going to be de highly detrimental to, to your group because not knowing how to fish, not knowing how to hunt, mm -hmm. not knowing how to even clean and cook the game once you have it could be lethal. That's fascinating to think of that as a basic resource, the knowledge to attain the very low level things of water. And right, and we'll figure it out. We yeah. did it once before, and we've done it over and over and over and over again. It's just costly. Yes, it has costs, for sure. Um, but when you think of how you look at the, well, we'll just deal with the first world of the West. You look at the 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 path line, the pathway of, of Western civilization and its growth, and then you look at how technology injected into it over time you know, how it magnifies uh, things or how it pushes things at, at uh, orders of magnitude faster. And then the internet comes along and even faster, you know. And so you're watching industrial revolution to, what is it, the, uh, the capacitor and then so on. It goes further and further. And as the internet and technology, especially on the electronic side of things, start increasing in capability, it massively outpaces even our uh, necessity for it at times. It, it becomes, you know, plant obsolescence happens quicker and over and over and over again. And wealth increases, 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 increases in terms of the things that we're able to acquire, right? Yeah. I mean, you, I've seen homeless people with, with smartphones, yeah. you know? So we're living in the most wealth-laden, luxury-laden age of all of humanity yet. What happens when we see calamity or people go on hard time? What are they, the things that they value, you know, what, what, is, what do people go to an argument about the cost of things that are luxury items generally and not necessity items? Mm -hmm. You know, we get into fights about, um, you know, things that are at the end of the day, not necessities to us. You know, people are so concerned about Netflix and, and the internet and, and Personally, I'm very concerned about the internet because I look at it as my own little personal library of Alexandria in my pocket. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about it. And the ability to have a tool as effective as it is, even though I'm in a constant battle, to not let that tool become a vice or to become something that that actually brings me to a lower state. <laughs> but are we will the question is over the are we willing to murder each other over Netflix versus murder each other over water? We're willing to murder each other over water. That's a given. You right, know? but that's our animalistic selves of that. Well, it's also a necessity for, it's animalistic, but it's also either you do it or you don't, right? Like, unless somebody's willing to share that water or if that water is of such a limited uh, a ca a capability or uh, such a limited amount, then you will have to murder right. to have right. that over water. Netflix, the argument is the higher, we get up to this hierarchy of, what we consider in Los Angeles yeah. resources, yes, we were, we're less we're, willing to be to commit violence. Yes, we are less willing to commit violence. That, oh, I would say over Netflix, but we are willing to commit violence over Netflix, over everything associated with Netflix, over televisions, over sneakers, over over. Um, you know, I mean, when we look at uh, a good, a, I mean, the majority of the stuff that came with the riots. I mean, it was used car dealerships uh targets i mean and then you look and it's like well okay well what are people what do they got what are they so hell-bent to get out of this whole thing and i'm even talking about the ideological elements or anything like that just like okay something's going on boom looting whatever yeah we you know there's stuff what, what are you gonna loot yeah you know you'll have aoc say oh people needing bread like they ain't, i didn't see a single loaf of bread you know i saw te televisions it's and poetry shoes josh and, you know but 
to me, it is poetry in a sense because you get to see who we, how we actually are operating. You know, what, what are where what is becoming first principles to most people? But wait, wait. But you could also argue that those riots were more like the madness of crowds, which is oh, like, it's definitely a lot more than just that. I'm just saying that given a chance, it's like okay. Boom! the The lights are off. The grid is down. We've we've hacked into the whole system. <laughs> Turned into an '80s movie, and you have the ability to go get a hold of whatever it is that you think is most important. And what do we do? And I say we, as in you know, including all of us, we grab a TV. We we attack it. We 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 break into a sneaker store on Melrose. We do. It's just like uh, we still giant cause statues where the value of that is completely market driven. Like it's just a piece of polypropylene or whatever, butyl. And you know, it's cool. You know, I, I'm a big fan of art, uh, but uh, it's like, <laughs> you know, I can't eat that. And at the end of the day, man, you're sitting there with your, with your like, what'd you do today, honey? What'd you get? You know, man, did we, we were able to, you know, oh, I got this, I got this designer art statue. <laughs> are, yeah. are, are you gonna go, well, you can't really sell it on the on like the art markets where people are really going to pay for it. Yeah. So, are you going to become an underground art dealer with your one piece of cause art? One interesting thing, just uh, before I forget it, you mentioned the Library of Alexandria yeah. and your phone. Well, your phone, <laughs> but also just thinking of your little world that you're creating for yourself on the internet. That's a really powerful way to actually phrase it. One of the things that. Uh, You've been on Joe Rogan several times. Uh, Although always, everybody always comes to me and go, oh, that was so great. I didn't know, you, you're on, you've been on Joe Rogan? I go, this is like my fifth time, dude. I've been a fan of yours for a long time from uh, from other avenues. Yeah, this and, is a long time coming, actually. Everybody, yeah. you have no idea. Like how many times through uh, messaging and missing each other over the years, this is ridiculous. This is a long time coming. You don't know, realize how special this is for us. This is, a, well, I'm also starstruck. We'll talk about this, but you symbolize something very important to me through my journey, through wrestling, through jujitsu, through judo, through just street fighting, through just combat. Mm -hmm. There's a, you're the, in some sense, the devil on my shoulder of like, of violence mm -hmm. in a good, in the, in, in a, the devil gets a bad rap. It does, he does get a bad rap. I realize, you know, sitting encased in, in ice down at that, that low ass level, you know. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> but, you know, the angel side is more like the athletic, the sport, the science, mm -hmm. the, tech, the, the technical, the chess side of things. So, uh, but on the Library of Alexander, let me ask uh, be, because you were on Joe Rogan, it does make me really sad. And I realize that I'm just probably being romantic that his most of his library of interviews that were on YouTube mm -hmm. have now been taken down yes, because he went right. to Spotify. And that was the first, I'm probably an idiot, but it was the first time I realized that this knowledge that we've been building up on the internet doesn't necessarily last forever. No, it doesn't, unless you preserve it. I mean, it's like all things. If, if you do not preserve them, if you do not make uh, efforts um, you know, so many of my, I th it just really brings to mind right off the top of my head, all my, uh, so many friends of, uh, of mine that are Jewish, uh, you know, they're, they're basically secular, but yet through even the secular aspect of just keeping the traditions alive, it's like, well, you could always pick a book and read about, read about it. Clearly <laughs> it's called the Torah. But, um, if you don't put these things into action, if you don't make them a part of y your consciousness, maybe even on the subconsciousness, just by, through through repetition, they will die. They will become simply something that exists somewhere until you find it again. And Carl Gotch used to say something. Um, he would say that I don't invent moves, I just rediscover them. But yet, Gotch and Billy Robinson also would understand uh, that you, if someone's not carrying the, the torch, it'll go out. Now that doesn't mean fire can't be rekindled. It just means that it, that torch no longer is lighting the way on, on this knowledge. And so it's, it's important to be an individual, even on, on an individual level to be a repository for, for aspects of knowledge. You mentioned Gotch, you, uh, consider yourself a catch a uh, wrestler. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've mentioned to you offline that I competed in a couple of catch wrestling mm -hmm. tournaments. 
Uh, can we go Wikipedia level at the very basic? You're the yes. exactly right person to ask, what is catch wrestling and what are its defining principles? I would say the easiest way for us to talk about and give uh, an overview of what catch is in the simplest terms is think of collegiate wrestling with submissions. That is essentially what catch is. And it's not surprising because collegiate wrestling is actually derived from catch as catch can. It's just that over time, certain aspects were, were um, uh, removed from the competition structure so that they became uh, null elements, things that were discarded. Uh, but it's funny that you can take high level uh, amateur coll collegiate types and you can show them a move and then add a little bit to it and go, oh, well, hey, that was just like what we already do here, but except, oh, I didn't know you could take it all the way to this point or, you know, things of that nature, especially even when it comes to professional wrestling, like uh, teaching people like, no, that, that I know you're just using this for uh, in a show, but this is actually a real move and here's how it really feels. And so collegiate wrestling and wrestling in general for people who are not aware is, is basically two people start on their feet mm -hmm. and they have to score that they're trying to take each other down and they have to um they score points along the way you can end matches by pinning them for example mm -hmm. on their back i think one way to describe wrestling is uh it's very much about figuring out ways to establish control and leverage in these kind of uh tie-ups or there's different styles where you can do more from a distance to where it's more about the timing and all that kind of stuff Ultimately, it's an art of like both upper body and lower body, and you could choose the different puzzles that you solve there. You could be attacking the head, the arms, you could be attacking the legs. There's also part of collegiate wrestling that's on the ground mm -hmm. that has more uh, what's called like a referee's position. Or right, whatever. the referee's position where you're on uh, your hands and knees, yeah. basically. And so... Uh, do you, do, you, do you understand what that's supposed to simulate? Why is that one of the standard positions? It's one of the standard positions because one, it's one of the easiest ways to actually get up. Um, but two, it's because you cannot be on your back. If you're on your back, you're getting pinned. And back exposure or being pinned is pretty much the universal wrestling uh, thing. One, taking the guy from their feet to the floor. Uh, and two, pinning them. As you go from like, was it uh, Cornish wrestling, t Turkish oil wrestling, Mongolian, sumo, uh, Indian, um, well, they'll call it Pelwani. It's also called Kushti, um, Jiu Jitsu, Judo. Um, so many of them is like, there's a Sambo. Even if it doesn't end the match, it's still like one of the most important aspects of the competition itself across. So, but every style. And this is where submission, like catch wrestling or uh, submission wrestling or jujitsu feels different, which it seems like for most wrestling, for a lot of wrestling, mm -hmm. the dominance is the, is the goal mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to submission, mm -hmm. which I, I guess those are two are related, but dominating the position. So that's what pinning is. It's almost like breaking your opponent like breaking uh, through all of their defenses to where they're completely defenseless and you could do anything with them that you want. Maybe that's a Wikipedia definition of dominance. I don't know. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, it sounds very much like a uh, chain to a radiator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, uh, there's a thread that connects all yeah. partners. Uh, but submission feels different. Uh, I mean, it is actually different when you think about it across the landscape. I don't think radically different, but just still slightly different in that. Um, if you think of wrestling as being derived from 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 combat, right? So, well, it is combat sports, but more more lethal combat. Getting somebody off their feet and onto their back is about as lethal a place for the person on bottom to be in general. I mean, I, I, I don't don't come at me with your talks about your fucking worm guards and blah 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 and whatever fit spider bear. Them. Yeah. Okay, get out of here with that. This yeah. is, we're not talking about you in this highly uh, regimented sporting environment. We're talking about general, you know, all the body hair, none of the waxing human beings. So uh, getting someone on their back, 
okay, there, how, you, you, as you're trying to get up, you're getting hit with a rock or stabbed or what have you, set on fire, who knows. Generally, these conflicts are not just isolated to one-on-one. You, it's if it's four on two, your 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 buddy that was with you back to back. Now he's on his back. What do you think? And now it's going to be one on one while three go on one. Yeah. So and then you go, you elevate this to to armored combat, right? Mm-hmm. And it's boom, put them on the ground. Oh crap, it's hard to get up. Well, while you're struggling to get up, stab. You know that's where jujitsu's uh, concepts come from with all their leveraging and off balancing is. Oh man, if I end up in this situation in tight close quarters combat, yes, we could fight it out with swords and knives and what have you, but it's way easier if the first thing I can do is foot sweep you onto your back and then pull my knife and just go stick. Is there a thread that connects all of these different arts from not just arts, but from the very base violence of war, just like you said, that there's no rules mm-hmm. to the very regimented uh IBJJF, I do jiu jitsu tournaments, and just you kind of laid out some of it, but can you go all the way to the well? So when you you start off with absolute skills in the sense of absolute offense and defense in the taking or preserving of life, right? Full on at its at its purest form of self defense and self preservation. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you extrapolate part of that in that all animals train in violence. All play usually degenerates into some sort of soft violence. So be it cats when they're kittens and puppies and all the, everything learns how to kill, how to fight. Um, not that, you know, just to, that, that dumb alpha meme stuff where the idea is that, oh, by being alpha, that means you run around like basically just being a bully and a shithead. And it's like, mm-hmm. No, actually alpha wolves spend very little time fighting because if you were actually alpha, you don't get into fights. Mm -hmm. There's no need to. Um, And if you are probably getting into any large amount of fights, it's probably because you're being shitty at being an alpha and now people are tired of you being in charge. Mm -hmm. Um, And and yet in the animal world, and it would be the same for human beings at that, that, that base beginning level of violence, there's a big risk. So I know that we live in this place with healthcare and where, or you might be in a place with nationalized health, whatever, right? There's, there's, there's band-aids, there's, there's, uh, 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 penicillin, there's all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. but that's not the normal way of things, you know? Uh, yeah. There's a, a channel that just hurts me every time I, I used to follow it and I had to unfollow it cause it was too painful for me as a human being called nature is metal. Ah, yes. On Instagram. It was, uh, sobering and then it was like this is too sober <laughs> it's very to... <laughs> sobering so in there the risk is at its highest level there the damage you take mm-hmm. the the winner walks away hurt getting lamed and when you need every aspect of your physical and athletic faculties to survive because it isn't going to be the the this isn't the first and it, it's definitely not going to be the last especially if you're the slowest one you know, it's a, uh, what is it? Was it, uh, is a, a lyric from a clutch song? Uh, don't go for the fat ones, just go for the slow ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But that the universal truth of the way nature works. Just, well, you you watch, said it's not yeah, cruel. Watch. It's not cruel. It's just the way it is. Yeah. I mean, watch uh, animals get into fights on, on any of these sort of documentary stuff. You'll see an intense, short, and then dispersal. Like you'll see as soon as one feels like, uh, things have switched yeah. just enough that boom, the bear or whatever it is takes off. It's like, I'm not, I'm done with this because if you can get out of there with just some scars and what have you, okay, you lose an eye. Eh, nah, that's not as good. Uh, you really get hurt bad and get infected. You're done, yeah. you know? So it, it there's a, a serious risk to be, um, that can come with these sort of things. Yet I believe that we are inherently, born for at least aspects of and use of violence and so at the end of the day we need these things not just to not just survive each other but they're they're a part of being able to hunt and other things but um, so violence is a part of human nature violence is a is is like an it's an absolute it is in every person it is a part of every interaction it is a part of every every law everything and i'm not by the way i'm not an ancap 
So don't even don't don't hit your wagon to me on that one. NCAP is an anarchic capitalist. An capitalist, yes. Yeah. <laughs> not a not an ANCAP. But they I, have I, nice book bookshops. Yeah, That's they cool. do. I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna, <laughs> you know, sit here and, and shit talk ANCAPs. Uh although I also used to get into the conversations with uh with uh an ANCOM, uh anarcho communist, uh a good friend of mine, and he would he would bring up this stuff and I'm like, Yeah, cool, man. I'm down with anarchy. You ain't gonna like it. Like, what so, do you mean? I go because I'm gonna take. All, I'm gonna <laughs> gather all kinds of people. Together. I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna get the strongest together. And yeah. I'm going to take your shit. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you on that uh, topic? I've um, a friend of mine now, uh, a fellow Russian, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Michael Malice. Oh, I, yeah, I'm familiar with Michael Malice. <laughs> I watched a little bit of your guys' uh, conversation. So <laughs> this is really good to ask you because. Uh, I like you're, how he's in the white suit and, and, yeah. and you're in the, the white and black. Yeah. But he, he lives in New York City. Mm -hmm. He is uh, espouses ideas of anarchism. Mm -hmm. And his idea, and this is different than um, sort of the Ayn Rand uh, set of ideas, that there's a line between sort of capitalism that's backed by the state and mm -hmm. just pure anarchism. And his idea that violence won't take over uh, in an anarchism is one that feels to me not grounded in reality. I may be, I, I may be wrong. So is there some? So uh, the idea with pure capitalism is that you mean laissez-faire, completely deregulated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, what it will agree, the, it'll end up in one. It'll end up in if if you're anti-globalist, it's gonna be that. It's gonna be globalist a hundred percent because it has no con pure capitalism has no consideration for uh has no consideration for your your native users or of any sort like yeah, it, it land doesn't, doesn't matter and but the idea of governments is that the land the little piece of land you're geographically you're born on means you're going to stick to whatever founding documents mm -hmm. created that little land so anarchism is against that and the argument is you should be able to choose which ideas you live with mm -hmm. And the concern there is nobody, uh, th this geographical little land, the governments mm -hmm. that organize on that land will not, do not need to protect you from the violence. And my sense is there does need to be an army, there does need to be police that help, well, however the form that police takes, but there needs to be a s more centralized, not completely centralized, but more centralized safety net of, to protect you from the violence. Scale again, right? So if you want to have your anarchist utopia, well, we well, won't we'll call it utopia, your anarchist uh, creation here, at certain scale, I'm sure it's doable, you know? Um, but as it scales, as the scale increases, it's completely untenable and a state will emerge. A state will always state, emerge because emerged, because yeah. even people always think of states as as like people rubbing their hands and smoking cigars in back rooms yeah. and just out of nowhere coming around and it's like oh well, we're going to create this big centralized thing and just so that we can tell everybody what to do and we can be in charge. I mean, I know that there are people like that that exist that they would like to do things of that nature and that they see uh, the use of power as something to be used more for their their personal gains over first which again self-interest in human beings but um uh but, eventually but a state people want us they want something to go like okay who's taking care of this and who's taking care of that and who and how do we create some sort of uh some sort of uh protocol for this like okay well when it's not bob when is it Susie? when is it whatever i mean like how do we you know, so it's got to get done if we want this thing to become bigger, if we want our all of our plumbing to, to work right, if we want, it's just, I'm sorry, a state's going to happen. A state is also, when you think about it, is supposed to have consideration to tribe, right? So if people think that we're not tribes, well, you're not, you're not really thinking very deeply. We're all tribes of a sort. And uh, I, everybody likes to use the word tribalism and this idea of, of, of this uh, antagonistic concept. But and while sure tribalism can be antagonistic, tribalism can also be uh, a positive thing. Or I could just say it just seems to be a natural thing. People, you know, they create their their groups of one sort or another. And so when you have 
well, when you think about where when nation states really started to become a thing, uh, and I don't mean even the more modern looking variants that we could think back of and say the 19th century or something like that. Right. Even older than that. I mean, do you think the Assyrians didn't have a state of some sort? Of course they did. Um, they. How do you increase your 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 empire if you don't actually have a place to start from? Has to be a ruler. So you're saying like naturally, it, when you start talking, thinking about scale of humans, naturally states emerge. And so can we try to make an argument for anarchism? Which is uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Me, uh, <laughs> so uh, a- a- anarchy, in a sense, is an opposition to the unhelpful, unproductive, inefficient bureaucracies mm-hmm. that eventually the states lead to. Yes, so, and that's what we can see. I mean, I would say less anarchy, let more study James Burnham, you know, uh, or well any anybody that wants to talk about the the managerial problem and the managerial I see. so you you have a sense a hope maybe let's think like what is the path forward with the inefficient state is it revolution or is it to work within the system to constantly improve it to <sighs> man i don't it? know that one i mean my general sense uh and maybe this is the nietzschean part of me is that yeah it'll it, it would take maybe not even just re- maybe not even defining uh it specifically as revolution maybe it would just take s- just total calamity to to get people to stop people being up. shitty to not stop being a lesser version of themselves to stop thinking more about uh things from you know the paradigm that we exist in now where we're we're giving so much value to stuff that isn't really all that valuable yeah. you know where we're so concerned about likes and i don't just mean like whether we get them or not but that, oh man, maybe we should take this off of our platform because this is too destabilizing to people. And it's like, because once you exceed Dunbar's number, I think it's actually without having the right faculties, which would need to be developed because this is dealing with, this is dealing with tech that brings things, ways of approaching being that we are not naturally programmed to be able uh, to handle appropriately yeah. so and i think as even 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 more it's even more detrimental to women than men because i think uh women have a more natural proclivity towards um uh group association and uh, and and more group oriented thinking and patterning and now and with also coupled with seemingly more sensitivity towards towards human uh states so i feel like women like the, the classic idea is like oh you know women are psychic you know they have a sixth sense and what have you and i think that's just a uh, uh, a way of uh simplifying what i think is that women may be more in tune with picking up on the unsaid like they might be better at at, at seeing um uh, physical cues, uh, inflection and tone, like different, like they may be far more sensitive to these things, which to me would make sense because dealing with children that can't uh, communicate uh, so, so generally more distinctively in all the full forms. Right now, okay, now whether it be a woman or a man, but especially with even the social uh, push on this concept of empathy, which of course it gets to the point where it loses any meaning anymore. Like people use the word empathy in, absolutely incorrectly all the time and they don't even understand what you're really asking of people but let's just take it as as we're using empathy in the correct sense yeah. and you're taking on the emotional content of the thing itself now you open that up to thousands of people maybe hundreds of thousands of people all across the world that you will never meet that you will never know that you're not even getting an actual true representation most of the time of who these people are you're you're meeting persona and some of these personas are de- even deliberately created to elicit a response inauthentically. Are you referring to bots or uh, could be artists? bots or actual people? Bots are one thing, but I mean there are literal people out there that will create something, create uh, GoFundMe's for for tragedies that never didn't really or events that didn't happen or any number of things. 
okay, I mean, burn their own house down and then say, you know, we were attacked. And then it comes down, oh, you did it to yourself because you wanted money and empathy and this, that, and you wanted all this, this emotional wealth, let's say this emotional uh, coin, Mm -hmm. as well as actual, if possible, you wanted to leverage it in some way. That's not the majority of people, but I would say a good amount of folks are thinking, well, if I post this photo, um, and I put this little blurb in there, I bet I can get this much cachet out of it in this sense. And I'm not even, and this isn't just a reference to like butt pics and stuff like that, because clearly, obviously people understand that, that, uh, our inborn, uh, sexual nature is easy to manipulate. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's pretty, pretty obvious. But you're, you're, you're saying this kind of new medium of communication on social media is, uh, is is unnatural and it preys on us and so as you you want this you know you look at you look at an anarchist kind of mindset right and so you just like there's no there there is no overarching state to to create any kind of uh structure right and so if you have that unfettered capitalism aspect with it and before I say anything particularly damning about unfettered capitalism, uh, I'm a massive capitalist because I view capitalism essentially as what it boils down to. Uh, I get these arguments with people too. They they start giving me all these extra definitions about capitalism. I'm like, no, no, this is obviously some sort of theory you're taking from other shit, but that doesn't describe capitalism. Capitalism is the ability for us to create whatever we want, you know, create our, our thoughts, ideas, physical things and trade them freely amongst each other uh, in in ways that we find um f- acceptable mm-hmm. right you know i'm not even using the word fair because i might think it's fair to me you might think huh well i mean that was actually i think he what he thought was unfair to him and it's more fair to me yeah. and then someone a third observer goes oh man you should have you should not have paid that for that you should have paid this and it's like well you know what it works for me without it's sufficiently acceptable that you uh, you both agreed to the transaction correct and uh you know but but also at the at the root of that is freedom right and as far as i can tell i've been banging this around in my head it's like for every one unit of freedom you need two units of ex- accountability <laughs> and if you don't have that what you end up with is it's human self-interest we're not even going to get into evil human self-interest sabotaging other things even not in a, in a sense to be malicious okay so in terms of uh let's let's put this as mathematically speaking i love this so uh, anarchism is more like two units of freedom and one unit of accountability or maybe yeah. zero units of accountability. Possibly. I mean, the <laughs> anarchists tend to think like, no, everyone will be accountable. It's like, yeah. the fuck they will. <laughs> when, when have you seen this happen in real life? Yeah. You know, I mean, people aren't even accountable in their revolutions half the time. <laughs> so uh, you aren't looking at the way people really are. It's like Marx is like, yeah, the, the people are like this. They're like that. Look at how capitalism does it. I mean, he, uh, of course, assigns a lot of really ridiculous economic principles and practice uh, but and also assumes that everybody you know who makes any profit from anything is somehow stealing it and you know really assigns a negative moral aspect to them and then it's like oh yeah but then eventually communism will happen every, no one will act that way anymore and you're like whoa hold on you just said that people yeah. are all are you saying it's all due to capitalism or it's is it innate it's just it's a fundamental un- misunderstanding of and it's like hey Look at you. You're like a notorious, like anti-Semitic, angry, like uh just absolute curmudgeon of a human being who seems to be really not all that fun to be around. Marx? Yet, yeah. And then it's just like So you have to think like if if there was one billion Marxes in the world, how would, would they all, behave? It would be absolute <laughs> <laughs> They would hate each other so bad. And you know, this isn't for me to even poison the well on Marx is like, oh, his personality sucks. It's like, there's lots of people whose personality sucks. Yeah. That doesn't Nietzsche. mean they can't make, I, I don't know that his name, what? You know, somebody argues. He's, he's just a, he's a loner. I mean, I don't know that his personality sucked at all. Let me walk that back and that he was human. Uh, saying his personality sucked. He was sometimes contradictory, yes. irrational. Sometimes he was uh, quite 
sexist despite the emails I've gotten that uh that that despite the emails I've gotten that, that well. told me that uh that there's there's people who's written to me that uh, Nietzsche has been unfairly labeled as sexist in his tre- discussion about women. Mm. I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of documents where he's just like he's just a bitter guy. I well, I, I will agree with you and Marx is as bitter as they come to but um you know what bitterness in and of itself doesn't make like what why i i hate marxism comes from you know the the whole the the entirety of the thing and but the dismissal of human nature but but i'm not going to say that marxism or practice man you can find any forbidden book and it could have something good in it as kernels a good idea yeah and like at the end of the day you know marx is a human being yeah. he's got a well, nice beard yeah he does he had a hell of a beard yeah a decent portrait i mean he looks like the kind of guy like i wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley but thankfully i don't think he was much of a fighter <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in any case i mean not the anarchists are are, are are they're more hot for like uh max sterner people like to think that uh nietzsche I borrowed a lot from Sterner, and my argument is, one, you don't have any real evidence for that, and two, bullshit. <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody could, I, I, the fact that they have some overlapping thoughts doesn't make it uh, lifted. Not to mention, go read a lot more philosophy and see how there's so many different things. Oh, this guy said it in uh, 1722. Well, and then this guy says it again in 1922. Does that mean he read the other guy's stuff? Not necessarily. I mean, he's working from the same type of human uh, physiological construct as anybody else. Like, of course, it's possible that this guy could think the same thing. We we think a lot of the same things, to be perfectly honest. I mean, reading the Hagakure, going back to philosophy books, this was really impactful on me as a younger adult because here's a book written in the 19th century about someone who lived through uh, the 19th and 18th century at times as a samurai, now a monk. And his objections to society at the time, the same objections one was having to society as I was reading it, like the same human behaviors, the same uh, uh, impetus for action that he found uh, a problem. Like, well, that's the same, that's the same shit now. Like, Mm -hmm. we're not, and this is the thing, and then I'm reading more religion, I go, oh, we're no different than anyone who wrote the Torah or older, we are the same thing with the same problems, with the same uh, psychological issues, the same human behaviors. Like these things are not different. Yeah, and we haven't changed. Growing set of tools, though, to to kill each other with or mm-hmm. to communicate together and all that kind of stuff. But underlying it, there's a human nature. Well, we're also trying to understand that human nature. I think we've, just like you said, learning how to fish, acquired more and more knowledge about mm-hmm. that human nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's been a very slow journey, it's slower than people realize. Yes. Uh, in terms of understanding uh, human nature. Let me ask in terms of egoism, I'd be curious uh, <laughs> uh, to, to get your sense about Ayn Rand and mm-hmm. um, her whole idea of virtue of like selfishness. Sure. And her, because you mentioned that everybody has a kernel of truth. There, there's potential for a kernel truth to be discovered in, any, in anything. For example, I've been recently reading Mein Kampf. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sh- you know what? That's the thing. Even there's something in, there's probably things in Mein Kampf that are not the surface level read. If you get all hung up on on all, probably all his crap about, uh, you know, his anger, anger at Jews and this and that, all this crap. It's like, okay, yeah, that that's right on the surface. Try to get below that. Try to see, you know, how is he, how is he creating the Jews as a cope somehow? Like how is yeah. he using, why, why are they his, his scapegoat? And I mean, scapegoat in the, so René Girard's uh, concept of the scapegoat. I mean, in that sense, whereas, uh, you know, Hitler uses, it wants to make the the Jews uh, the scapegoat for World War One. Yeah, I mean, what? for me, the starting point, similar with Ayn Rand, is uh, th- like Mein Kampf is not a good place to search, not just because Hitler is evil, but it's just not full of ideas. No, it is not. It has its significance due to a lot of Historically things. speaking. Yeah, but, but the yeah. starting point for me with Hitler is like to acknowledge that he's human and 
to at least consider the possibility that any one of us could have been Hitler. So like the, not well, that's make a Peterson the, kind of concept. Also, um, Jonathan Haidt has a thing about uh, the difference between hate and disgust mechanisms and things yeah. like that. And so he used he goes into the looking at uh, Hitler and his through his his diary entries and journals and stuff like that mm -hmm. to look uh, and see it more as the the disgust mechanism. Then also try and see like if there's any evolutionary biological uh, attachment to this, whatever. I mean. You're right. He is a human being. Any of us are, we're all human beings. It's not that it's probably jarring for people to think, but we're, we're all, I guess, supposed potentially capable of just being in, and all these evil people in the world think they're doing it for the sake of good. Yeah. Which makes them the most dangerous. And there's some, there's differences in levels of insane. Mm -hmm. I think Hitler was way more insane than Stalin. I think Stalin legitimately thought he was being doing good. I would uh, like, say that's probably true. Stalin it was just outright brutal. Like yeah. he had he had his five year plan. He had all these other things. Uh, he just had a much lower value for human life. Yes, and so he was willing to take make decisions about what he actually as a as a good executive. Mm -hmm. of which he was of managing different uh, bureaucracies and so on. He was willing to make decisions that resulted in mass human suffering where Hitler was, it seems like to me, what much moodier. So allowed emotions and moods to make yeah. decisions. I think we also have to consider um, the different trajectories and how, where and when they were making their decisions. And I mean, not by time specifically, but you know, Hitler engaged into this, this conflict across multiple continents. And then that everything that comes with basically fighting the whole world, Stalin had his conflict and then he really mostly compartmentalized the rest of it. So he was dealing with his own internal instead of dealing with the internal and the external. So if Stalin was put under a world war scenario, I don't know, maybe he would have eventually lost his marbles too. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you, that's, you're right there. The hunger for power was more internalized for Stalin. He wanted to control the land that already existed as opposed to wanting to colonize other land. He was as nationalistic as Hitler, but, uh, and was as, capable and willing for uh, violent conflict as Hitler for the, the aims of the state. Yeah. But he, he, he centered and internalized prior to then externalizing and moving outwards. Whereas even maybe prior to him, there was an interest to continually push communism in an uh, aggressive sense, following on the momentum from the, the what, 1918 revolution and that the halting of that uh through various aspects i guess uh, in germany part of that was the the national socialists like they they came up and then they they were the other ones to fight the communists and so you had the two totalitarians going after it um but then in the rest of the world that was not dealing with um totalitarian aspects th it was just it wasn't gonna stick especially in the west and other places but Stalin seen, just, you know, casually thinking, it seemed like Stalin decided to go, all right, well, we're not going to go just start launching right into more conflicts here. We're going to, these dudes are going down. So that's cool for us because they hate us and we hate them. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're going to, we're going to focus internally and then we're going to work on growing at a slower rate and picking our battles a bit more specifically. And of course there's, you know, you can get to the even this is after Stalin, but yeah, you got the Besmanov type stuff talking about subversion in in cultural aspects. Yeah, I mean, there's this fascinating dynamics to propaganda throughout the mm -hmm. whole period. That that's yeah, that's, that's a whole nother kernel. Yeah. Do you think Hitler could have been stopped? One of the things that's kind of fascinating mm -hmm. to look at is how many nations, both journalists and nations, wanted almost craved to take Hitler at his word that he wanted peace until it was too late. Mm -hmm. They almost wanted to be delude themselves. I mean, the same is true with this, uh, Stalin. Uh, people wanted to take Stalin at his word for- oh, they still delude themselves. Yeah. That way we, will delude, we, we will delude ourselves over any number of things. 
and until even after the fact where the history just says, hey, fuck face, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, you, you cannot supplement your pseudo reality onto actual reality here. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, but yet we deal with people in pseudo realities constantly. It, I mean, it, it, we wow. will always find a way to, to change reality to suit our needs. Well, the nature of truth now, there's now multiple actual truth. It's kind of fascinating. There's multiple versions of history that people are telling. You know, the, the, the version yes. the <laughs> version of the, the, the Great Patriotic War in mm -hmm. Russia, the World War II in Russia is very different today under Putin mm -hmm. than the version that we're learning on the, in the United States and then different than the version in Europe. In the United States, uh, the, the hero of the war is the United States. In Europe, there's a much more sad and solemn story mm -hmm. of suffering and so on. Sure. In, in Russia, it's the great, uh, patriotic war yeah, you know it was the, it was a unifier uh, yeah. of a sense and it i mean yeah i mean you, you can't argue that war and conflict that and or i just even um reducing that to stressors agitation suffering doesn't m create human motivation you know we started this off you brought up uh frankel and i'm like yeah frankel's dope man search for meaning uh maslow's great and and I talked to you about how I started to think like, man, do, do the ability for human beings to, to, to live and or potentially flourish in the worst environments you can think of is pretty incredible in and of itself. And that it's a crazy thought to think that without Frankel and Maslow ending up in concentration camps, do they write some of the most important books on philosophy in the 20th century and that's insane on a lot of different levels but um yeah, suffering is a creative force i mean i don't do you think we'll always have war do you, yes do you, we will always have war in, in some form or another we we need quote unquote air quotes for those just listening uh <laughs> war to survive we need war to flourish we need at least can you explain the quote uh, the air quotes around well war? because uh take is, take 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 the you see wars as violence no wars okay. are not violence so like so when no, we're talking air quotes about, because uh while well, you know what us getting on the mat or just getting on these hardwood floors and wrestling yeah. around yeah is not literal war it's yeah. war of a sorts you know we're you know it is it is a diluted form of war american football is a diluted form of war all this these are diluted forms of war tennis is a diluted form of war um and i think the, one of the best explanations I ever got from this, and another person very uh, impactful on, on my life and outlook and w thinking about things, Cormac McCarthy. And so in Blood Meridian, there's this fantastic speech about war given by the judge, which there's a ton of fantastic speeches on things given by the judge. Yeah, all that exists in creation without my knowledge does so without my consent. I'm like, okay, that's pretty heavy. That's that's hard. Go oh, ahead. Can you break that up? Can you say that again? Uh, all things that exist in creation, all things that exist without my knowledge, do so without my consent. W what does that mean to you? Well, I think from the judge's perspective, it's like, well, I didn't consent to to that bird or that dog or this building or all this. Like all of this, you know, I didn't create it, so it's done so without my consent. And if it's up to my consent well, I'll design it how I want to. There's a, another similar uh, look into how the judges in that book is, he would study everything everywhere he went. And so he's collected this group of ne'er-do-wells from all over to go on these hunts uh, against uh, certain uh, tribes in, in the Southwest um, and getting paid by the US government, the Mexican government. So he's on these Indian hunts and yet they're going to all these different places and they would st stay the night in a cave somewhere and he would find cave paintings and he would write them all down or he would find old pieces. There's a, an example of him, uh, the narrator uh, explaining how watching the judge and how he drawing everything. He's got this notebook just full of things, drawings and, and writings and how he found like a piece of armor from a conquistador or something way back in the day, a Spanish armor, and he draws it into his, his book and then crushes it. You and know. so that, so the reason we will always have war in the society is because there's these struggle of, 
amongst people that want to be the designers. There's there's that, but it's I'm just saying that uh, he's got this whole quote on war, like war is about is is play. War, war is a game, and the difference is is that what's at stake. So all things are a game of some sort, and some you're putting up for it, or you're, what you're willing to put up for it determines whether or not you're going to participate or not. And you know all all aspects of any game is war. And it's just, what what is at stake? You know, if it's your life, it's a different story. If it's just a coin, it's another thing. A nice way to put it is uh, if humans play a game in this kind of pursuit of uh, creating, what, what, whatever the hell the reason is that we keep creating cooler and cooler things, mm -hmm. that, that it seems to be the result of a game that we naturally play, mm -hmm. we naturally mm -hmm. crave. I don't know. I mean, that's been the struggle of philosophy is to understand what is the underlying force of all that. Is it the will to power? Is it? I think will to power is a really great way of uh, of describing it. Do you want to be the winner of the game? No, not just. No, I don't look at will to power as being the winner of the game. Uh, well, I mean, if we're going to get philosophical, yes, you want to be the winner of the game. What does winning the game act, define? How you win? Everybody's going to define that win differently. You know, you could define the win in the most base level, like, oh, I got all the things. Well, if you got all those things without the the needing component of fulfillment, then you're going to be a very unhappy person with a whole lot of things. But there's a self-referential aspect to where, to me, the winner of the game is defined by the people playing the game. So if I'm playing a game, I want to win in the sense that most of the other people who are playing the game will say, yeah, that guy won by their by our collective definition of what if i just come up listen i'm sort of if i come well, that's up that's a lot own, of that's a lot of weight on the external on you right but that's that's how games seem to work somewhat so i'm already a winner in my life by defining my own definition of success. <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm basically the best person in the world at doing uh uh me at, at being lex yeah. Yeah. yeah so like and that i'm really happy with that that's yeah. that's a source of uh well i mean think about it well, games are also uh, iterated right so you you start off with your game yeah and then your game with your immediates and then the game further than that and the game further than that and then the game today and the game tomorrow and the game next week and so it never ends and if you try to keep thinking about it that way, no wonder people go crazy. But <laughs> we we don't want to think about things that way. We don't want to think about uh, being towards death. We don't want to think about uh, whether or not I'm going anywhere after this, other than in the ground or what have you. Like we, we you know, well, so all, all of these games are a sense of some distraction. This is where we uh, brought kind up. of. But I mean, it's it's violence. Is that um, we need to let this out, and so it it, it is of our kids need to wrestle and play just like animals need to wrestle and play we need to have forms of competition we need to have ways to to test ourselves to create um when uh what is it uh when at peace a man of war makes war with himself and so we need to be able to competently go at war with ourselves and go at war with our neighbor and go at war with our neighbor's neighbor in a way that is repeatable at the very least so one one way of saying that there will always be war. I mean, that's my ho hopeful view is that most of the war conducted in the future will be, like you said, the man must go to war with himself. That would it's, be great. That that's, that's what to me love is, is like focusing on yourself and your own improvement and your own creativity and towards others mm -hmm. feeling, uh, sort of emphasizing cooperative behavior and compassion and would be great. empathy. It would be great. But I mean, you can have, well, I'll put it to you this way. If you have uh, a whole community of Randians and a whole community of ANCOMs and they could all like, <laughs> uh, I don't know, a uh, toast of London on Netflix and they love Netflix and they love the internet and they love uh picking apart mon comp with you they love like they like they have all these things even the esoteric that they can they yeah. can they can get on with but yeah. at the at the fundamental root they cannot help but go to war because they are literally oil and water no the, but see but they would the the very labels they assign to themselves would need to dissipate well, this true. The, well, then you would have to stop being whatever it is that you took on as your ideological or religious point. 
right? Yeah, I mean, I there's some days I'm a ancom, some days I'm an ncap, some uh, <laughs> whatever the uh, anarchic uh, anarchic capital. I mean, yeah. there's it depends on the, uh, the the hour, the minute of the day. You're constantly changing moods and embracing that flow, the change of opinions, of ideas. As there's some days where, like I'm actually yeah. cognizant of the fact because I've been not getting my sleep. And after I get some sleep, I see I'm so much more optimistic about mm. the world. The less and less sleep I get, the more sad uh, and cynical I get. I can see that. There's I, an I, up and down. I, I, I don't even let my, well, okay. I try not to let. And most days it's never a problem. Any sort of like, uh, what, are the, what are the kids call it now? Black pilled way of thinking. Yes. Be my, <laughs> my, my over, my the umbrella in which I hang under. So we actually, uh, to drag us back, can we talk about Carl Gotch and Cat Tressley? Because <laughs> <laughs> I do want to make sure I touch, I touch uh, it. I mean, what? Uh, who were? Yo, Carl Gotch is. Uh, is he the greatest catch wrestler? I don't do you, know if he mind? was the greatest catch wrestler ever. I don't. I don't. I mean, he's one of them in, for, the, for a myriad of. Uh, of uh, Carl Gotch, uh, Billy Robinson, uh, Gotch and Robinson's trainer, Billy Riley. Um, so who are these figures and what do they bring? Mitsuo Maeda, he's one of the greatest catch wrestlers ever because right. he's responsible for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? Along with Gustavo Gracie. Okay, there's a bunch of things I'd like to say here, but one of the things that, that catch wrestling seemed to espouse as a principle is mm -hmm. that of violence. I, I, I just the the tournaments I competed at, uh, the unfortunate thing, and we'll mm -hmm. probably hopefully talk about it a little bit they were disorganized and the level of competition was pretty low sure. like people really sucked pretty typical <laughs> is that typical okay well it's it's i mean think about um you know, local run-of-the-mill yes uh jiu-jitsu tournament versus ibjjf created yeah. you know a vast difference so so i you know but there is a to me as a human being that like intellectually, philosophically, it was more interesting to go to a catch wrestling tournament. It seemed more real and honest because of the way they communicate about violence I love I and love aggression. That. So it is, it is often uh, more honest. I think that who as, is that from? Is that originated from? Gosh, is that really Rob is that Well, I, it, it originates from all wrestling in that uh, even Wade Wade Chalice, not a not a classically considered catch wrestler yet the reason why he has the world record for most amount of uh, world champions pinned or the record for pins in the ncaa is because well of course the idea is to put you on your back and to pin you but you're there's no way you're gonna let me do that uh so how do i make it so that you want me to pin you well <laughs> it's by you put him in excruciating pain yeah so at the end of the day you're both there you both want to win. Neither one wants to allow anything to the other. Yeah. So how do I how do I get you to lose to me? Well, I make it so unbearable for you that you decide losing is better than staying. So those are two. Those two are so fascinating because so coming from Russia, I don't know if that's where I got it or if it's just my own predisposition. Is I always loved the. Th there's two ways to get you to want to pin yourself. Yeah. One is to making it so painful not to pin yourself that you pin yourself or whatever. And the other is, it's sort of like uh, Bruce Lee water flows. Ma mm -hmm. Make it so easy to pin yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's technique, it's like the elegance, the ease of movement. This is the uh, Satyev brothers, Vasya mm -hmm. uh, Satyev. Uh, like the, just the elegance, the efficiency. Yeah, they're practicing the like of, ballet watching those yeah. guys. You know, it's incredible. Satyev brothers are massive. and. Uh, so and those I'll, are the two I'll, paths, I'll, I'll right? Also, caveat a little bit that, like, uh, if you're if you're approaching this from a, a, a Russian perspective, yeah. Russians are quite truthful about things, uh, especially when it comes to something like combat. They just this is how it is, yeah. and this is how it's going to be. It's honest, yes. But, but and the honesty is what I really like yeah. about uh, catch wrestling because I find that we, given any opportunity for us to be dishonest for any number of reasons, we're gonna. Uh, yeah. especially if it's a dishonesty towards a positive, right? Like, oh, well, you know, it's all technique and it's all this and it's the gentle art and blah. Bro, I have rolled with ADCC world champions, you know, some of the best you have ever heard of. There ain't a lot of gentleness 
when it comes to like, oh yeah, they wanted to sweep you and you said no. <laughs> and then you did said no again. Yeah. And then you said no and attacked their leg. Yeah. Like, it, it ceases to be all that gentle yeah. because at the end of the day, these dudes are strong as hell. They're flexible. They're all, I mean, they're, they're the difference between the athleticism and, and the, the ability to actually win is a pretty wide gap. The athleticism shows up, but then there's all that other extra. And part of that is meanness and and pain and uh, getting what you need out of it. But see, there is a philosophical difference in the way it's thought, because... I think some of it is just, they just in denial. Like, oh, people will, they, they like to, people like mm. to espouse a lot of things as theory. And then it's like, okay, let me watch. When they're Oh, you're not doing anything about what you said right now. In fact, you're doing the opposite. You're you're literally hurting that guy because you your shit ain't working in the way that you'd like it to. So you're having to use strength. You're having to, it's one of my favorites, like, oh, you're using too much strength. And it's like, well, hold on. Do we want people not to use strength at this point to understand more of mechanics? Or are you trying to tell people if they use strength at all, uh, that they're somehow bad at what they do? Because, you know, it's not my fault you're not stronger than me. But see, I'm speaking of something else that's... Uh, that's. Well, I tend to think what it comes down to is yes. like, strength is fine until you beat me with it. <laughs> then it sucks. See, but, okay, so strength is another thing. I, I'm speak, I'm thinking about more like anger. Oh, sure. Okay, so like... See, a lot I, of angry guys in jiu-jitsu, I know that. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, good. Well, but let's Tons talk about... Them. Let's talk about... They're only human. The highest level mm-hmm. of competition. There's a book called Wrestling Tough. Yeah. It's a really good book. There's, I've, I've encountered in my life a few, uh, especially in wrestling, people who really try to find a way to use anger, to get really angry at their opponent. Mm. Not like stupid anger, but just like- Intense, I, pointed uh, anger uh, distilled into something uh, that you can use as yeah. fuel. And like, there, there, I remember the story, I don't know where I read it, it might be Wrestling Tough, where a person was imagining that their opponent just raped their mother, raped their uh, girlfriend or something like that to to create this like method acting thing in their head to be like, to, to snap them out of this polite interaction of usual like athletic convention mm. and like Im- you know and really go to the primitive side. Design of necessity. So my anecdote for this was, I was sitting with uh, backstage before a fight, <clears throat> not my fight, and I'm I'm working with this guy, and this dude is this is a this is a world champion guy, uh, and he competed at the highest levels, uh, and he he looks at me and he goes, hmm, you know, I'm, you ever get nervous before fights? And I looked at him, and I went, no, I don't. And he just looks at me, he's like, fuck, man, I'm so nervous. You know, I, how do you do it, man? Well, you know, I, I wish it could be like you. And I said, you know what? That doesn't mean that what I'm doing is better. It's just what is necessary for me. It's the way I am. Mm-hmm. And I told him, and I, so this anecdote goes into another anecdote. This is a Family Guy episode, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> where some uh, another f- famous high-level guy told me about this experience with a, a world champion boxer in Japan and this guy would get insanely nervous and worked up and anxious before his matches and he hated it and hated it and hated it and so he wanted to get rid of that feeling so he went to a hypnotist for a bunch of sessions and managed to and he goes in and you know, next fight he's like, cool as a cucumber and doesn't perform and loses and so what i said going back to anecdote 1 was uh you know, whatever is necessary for you to get yourself in the best state of being right now to compete, whatever that may be, it could be absolute stress and fear. It could be anger. It could be calmness. It could be whatever. But there is a so brilliant. But there is a a there is a state at which you need to be in to do your best. And you as the individual, you have to find that. Can you comment on? uh tyson mike tyson oh so, yeah that thing <laughs> uh, so first so he uh there's two things i want to so he's mm-hmm. uh in terms of fear there's a clip there i think from a documentary where he talks mm-hmm. about he is like fully afraid as he walks up to the ring and as he gets closer and closer and closer he gets more confident until he gets in and then he's a god or something like that mm-hmm. that coupled with his statement on joe rogan 
that he gets aroused uh, at the possibility of true, like of hurting somebody in mm-hmm. the ring. So like he gets aroused at the violence. Yeah. Uh, so I like it because it's coupled to your basically statement that we need to own f- to find our own unique way of existing at our top level of performance. And that perhaps is Mike Tyson. But do you think there's something more deeply universal to the the Mike Tyson speaking to the fact that he's aroused at the he, possibility of yeah, violence? Yeah, I do actually. Uh, although I don't think that it always equates to arousal <laughs> for people. In fact, I would say in general, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I can say I've never had a boner in the ring. In fact, if anything, you know, old combat cock is like, we're not hanging around. We're yeah. leaving. We're going up. Yeah. We're taking off. Yeah. We don't want anything to do with this. Yes. You have fun. Come back yeah. to us when you yeah. have something uh, warmer, softer, smells better. Yeah. But um, the power, the feeling of aliveness. Yeah. I could see it. It being, you know, back to the, even the concept of the Ubermensch. I feel like the states, the highest states of being I've ever been in were in the midst of conflict. I felt like that was the time, those are the those are the moments in my life where I felt like I was at the highest level of, of being as a human in existence. But yet, even being in that state was not, it was not something that you could interact with people that weren't in that state with you. Like they wouldn't get it. You would almost seem, and to be that way all the time, either A, might drive you mad, or B, is you're not, you're something that's untenable to the rest of society. Like you can't function with everybody else. It will not work. It's just like you said with the Uberman, it's just like it's perhaps that ideal is not something you can hold for long. That's the, the very nature of it is. Yeah, well, there was an example in Thus Spoke Zarathustra about a snake being down the person's throat and biting it and then having this maniacal laughter erupting. And, you know, to me it was, uh, at least I read it as, yeah, okay, there's this insane moment that isn't forever, but that it is life and death. And it is, and and the overcoming it is the thing that all of a sudden gives you that tapping into the, the your, your highest state, right? This is, you know, man is uh, a chasm, a, a tightrope between uh, man and Ubermensch. Well, I, I don't want to leave your thought about uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll, we'll call those things flourishes to, to the aspect of, uh, Tyson's, uh, interpretation or, or his, his, his expression of his feelings in combat. And so I gave this antidote to the guy and I just, you know, at my first anecdote, uh, to that athlete I was working with. And I said, you know, this isn't, there isn't a superior way in this sense. There is the way that works for you. That may be something you can implement to other people if you find that person, because we all have different personalities. And, and to me, that's a, that, that is, that's an absolute, I, I don't want to, no, don't come at me with all your other fucking social sciences crap. No, we have distinct personalities. That, that personality, that, that who you really are. And this, you know, again, Heidegger, Dasein, like being authentic. If you're, if you're authentic with who you are, goods and bads, you will know how to create what that is. And for me, violence and fighting and conflict was something that always felt normal to me. And I don't mean normal in like I grew up in a war zone or a, a, a abusive household or something like that. I just meant that you know, I was a kid who was very joyful and inquisitive um, and spent a lot of time around older people of all things. Uh, and also, while I don't think I have much capability towards engineering my mom said that one of the first things as like a little baby when she put me in my sister's old crib instead of my sister who just milled about and was fine with it all the first thing i did was i completely deconstructed it i didn't break it i I figured out how to pull it apart curiosity about the world and yet that wasn't in conflict with the idea of violence no not at all and so being a very joyful and nice kid but you know kids are kids and and if if kids can find that you respond maybe more easily to agitation, they will agitate you. And if you should stand out in some way by being taller or bigger or something, or caring, Mm -hmm. especially, they will agitate you. They don't really fully understand it either. And so I don't, I don't hold anything against like any of the kids that used to pick on me or whatever, especially at the youngest ages, like, man, they don't know shit either. So, um, but once that line was pushed, for me, it was, oh, well, I was, I was being cool. Now you're being uncool. Yeah. 
well, then that gives me license for everything. Yeah. And so, boom, we would just go at it. Or kids that would try to initiate a fight. And I'm like, okay. And being in that moment of just going going to town with someone else, it just felt like this is this, this, I, be I I belong here. Yeah, too. it was it was never a problem for me. Like the in fact, if anything, the over what I had to understand was well, not only did I, I learn the hard way that it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what anybody else does. If your response in violence, even to their violence, if you're the winner, is often going to be penalized severely. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, society, state apparatus, they don't want any of that. They want to be the only arbiter of violence in the world always. But I learned a very difficult lesson with that and it was really impactful in a negative way on me, but also I had to learn on an individual sense to, you need to manage violence too, because, hey, if someone attacks you or starts a fight with you and you go at it, okay, beating them up is one thing, you know, um, you know, trying to grab a handful of broken glass from the street and throw it in their face, maybe that's a bit much at seven. So you need to learn what, what level is necessary and you need to learn what comes with, with all, what's the responsibility of, of when you enact violence. I mean, you take on something when you, you have a responsibility for that. This is a the extension of your actions. Um, so, uh, but as I got older and especially as I found sports and then combat sports, now this was a place for me to flourish and, to the point where I was more myself in that space than I was outside of it until time enough where I could learn to, to get this back together again. And I never say that I, that I'll merge the two or anything like that. No, all what happened, my, my, uh, uh, my journey, uh, from adolescence on to, uh, to manhood, a huge portion of it besides the normal finding yourself, whatever, whatever. Right. Actually, what it was, it was re getting back to who I always was. Getting that back curious to the curious kid, the kind kid. Getting back to the guy that I should have been allowed to become instead of what happened under the pressures of, of other things. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the attempt for society and and certain people within you know managerial positions to to compress what that was into something that they found more suitable. Yeah, but those pressures allow you to discover this little world, forbidden world in many ways of violence that mm -hmm. you could explore through sport. You can explore mm -hmm. it in, uh, it's more socially acceptable to explore it through sport. For sure, and even, but even then there's like, uh, at times it's socially unacceptable. So I beat Sam Schilt, I'm, he cut, my right eyebrow, I cut him and busted his nose, and he's bleeding all over me as I have an arm bar on top. I'm getting, you know, it's raining blood. Let's quote some Slayer uh, from a lacerated Sem Schilt, <laughs> bleeding in his horror, creating my structures. Now I shall rain in blood. But uh, I win the fight, arm bar, nasty one. I get on my feet and the first thing I do is I wipe all the blood off onto my hands and I lick it and I do my thing. Mm -hmm. And l all the MMA journalists freaked out. Dana Weiss like, man, I don't know about that. You know, we, you know, we don't want him doing, th everybody had this huge problem. And then some folks would even contend, with, oh, you know, we, look, you're trying to do like, no, 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 this isn't planned. This isn't, I don't yeah. think of these things. This yeah. isn't, the, this is how I really feel. Yeah. This is who I really am. And, you know, it was even kind of comical after the fact, you know, and, and BJ Penn was on the very card with me. Mm -hmm. Watching him at some point in his career, all of a sudden win fights and then and do this licking the glove thing. And everyone thinks it's the coolest thing ever. And I'm like, hey, fuck faces. I did this in 2002 or one, 2001. And BJ Penn actually back then was like, dude, you're a badass. You're a killer, yeah. <laughs> you know? Where did that come from? Because that seems like a deeply human moment. I could say, I could just be, you know, goofy about it and call it orgiastic. To, you know, to, to are we, line are with, we back with, with to Titan. Mike Tyson? Yeah, but Tyson, but uh, no, no, it, it, it isn't, it's beyond that. 
Is it a celebration I've had some pretty, of human I've had some pretty decent orgasms in my life at this point. I'm 43. Yeah. So, yeah. but no, none have ever compared to that. Like I said, it is a feeling of highest being to me. And That's I- That's your Ubermensch moment. This is, this is where I feel like the restrictions of general existence in society are gone. And I get to fully live uh, in a state that feels more meaningful of, of the most meaning. You know, I think of it as life and death. And- I, it's just, it is the way I'm built. And I don't have, I've never had any problem applying violence. Like it doesn't, I, I don't know where it comes from or how you would define it or whatever, if you want to stick me under in a, in a psychologist chair, but like, I don't, there's a part of me that can just like, I know if, if I'm going to apply, I can apply violence to any level and be okay with it. And it doesn't, I don't lose sleep. It doesn't bother me. It's not a problem. It's, it was, me learning how to fully understand violence, humans, and, and the broader perspective that allowed me to think about things and like, well, what am I, what, what do I really want to accomplish with my actions in the world just on a whole, you know, not compartmentalizing uh, my sporting career. Even when I get in the ring, y- y- I, I don't have any mercy generally. And if I do, it's because I make a, a, a really deliberate attempt to be in a state where I can have mercy. If I just go in there to fight with everything I got, I, there is zero. The mercy. natural state. There's violence. nothing, there's nothing okay. that will hold me back other than the referee. And that's that, you know, I, I know I agreed to, to be allowed to do and not to do, but, but within that, like, no. And I expect it to be done to me. But in terms of values, in terms of seeing what to me, violence is uh, is just yet another canvas that humans can uh, paint beautifully on. Clearly, I mean, uh, we have venerated the violent. Uh, there are communists that venerate the violent on their behalf. Mm-hmm. There are national socialists that venerate the violent there. And then if you remove it from an ideological perspective, we venerate the violent uh, when they're a hero. We venerate the violent in our religion. Well, I mean, I guess some people venerate the violence of, of Yahweh and Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So, or, or do we say Jehovah? I don't know. Is there, you've already mentioned one, but is there a fight where you've achieved the highest of heights for your own personal being, just when you look within yourself that you're the proudest of, or maybe was your most beautiful creation? Is this something that stands yeah, out? Yeah, there, there are a few actually. Uh, fighting semi shield and a rematch. Uh, well, the first one was pretty good too, uh, but the rematch was, I, I was suffering, I had suffered early, prior, the week prior to uh, food poisoning. And so while my abs are looking all right, uh, I, in the ring, didn't have the power that I expected to. And I was struggling in ways uh, in some of the grappling with the submission stuff that I hadn't accounted for. Just exhaustion or mental exhaustion? No, I mean like just physical, just I wasn't back up to a hundred percent in terms of just power output. And Semi was, well, he's always seven foot tall, but this time he was, the first time I fought him, he was 260, 257 or 260 something something like that this time he was like 290 yeah. and so he was a significantly bigger cat and he he was he's a big dude and i just remember being in up against the ropes with him changing levels trying to take him down and he's fighting he's hipping and i just thought in my head there's no fucking way i'm gonna lose this fight there's no way you are not going to beat me it's not gonna happen and i armbarred him the other arm <laughs> You remember the fact he's like, man, I really wanted to get you for that. I wanted to get that match back. Yeah. And then you fucking got my other arm, dick. I'm like, yeah, I'm, dude, I, I still love you though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that. So the, but the whole time you're like, so, so this has to do with the, the dichotomy of you're feeling your worst. And having to overcome. And, you're and like make literally it, mentally telling yourself there's I'm, no way. There's no fucking way I'm going to lose this fight. And then there's even my last bare knuckle match and getting in the ring and fighting bare knuckle uh, boxing for the first time. Um, and just thinking, just being in a, in a great state and just, just looking so forward to seeing, I mean, I called someone, uh, I was talking to them the night before and I said, yeah, well, I, I want, you know, I video called you because this face might not look like this. 
when I see you next. And they're just like, ooh, uh, okay. So it's not just like empty trash talk. That's no. That's like a clarity of mind and the seriousness of yeah, all this. I, 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 go, I might die. Battle. I'm most pretty high chance of, of being deformed some way. So, but fuck it. I don't really Are care. you? Do you think about, are you accepting your own death? Yes, when you go in the 100%. Yeah, I, in fact, and that's, in a strange way, that's partially what makes it so elevated in terms of my, my sense of feeling by being able to uh, have death at my side, it feels good. And to be there and to think that this could be the one, like, why not, you know? Uh, I'm not a religious person at all, even though I very much have to seem, seems to bang on the drum about the usefulness or the understanding the usefulness of religion for people. Um, but you know, if, 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 if I got to do something, then yeah, put me in Valhalla, man. I don't want to be anywhere else. Nothing else seems like a good place for me to be. I want to, I want to fight all day long and feast all night. You know, it sounds great. <laughs> I saw you, uh, throw your hat into the ring of Fedor Emelianenko. Yes. He got COVID, I guess. I hope he, I hope he overcomes it and comes out just as good, if not better. Epic with that. Did I understand correctly that that might be his last fight? Yes. That's my understanding. How and it would be would epic be as a- hell. And it would be epic as hell because the the person that I want to give my most to is a person that I respect, especially at this this long uh, at this long this 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 long career of mine and getting at this 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 his twilight well. years. It's like two warriors. Yeah. And 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 that's the thing about even this going in there with the aspect of being with death and all that is that when that person is in there, they are my brother with me in this. And that so when you give me your best, even if I even if I win dominant fashion, but if you show up and you're as authentic and, and being here as I am, then then I love you and I'm glad for you yeah. to be here and we're in this together. And and at this point, you know, your loss or my loss or whatever is no less deserving of veneration than the win. Like we're here in this. And so to be in the ring with Fyodor and to venerate him in win or defeat to be in there with with someone uh, like that is to me, it's so rare, so. It's incredible how the ultimate violence is coupled with like love or respect. And it's like, it's, it's weird how this is, uh, how the competition in its violent form is also a uh, veneration of just the human connection. It's also hum- the removal. I feel like it's the purest, one it's of honest, the purest like ways, purest, on, most honest places a person can exist. Uh, that line in Fight Club, you don't know really who you are until you've been in a fight. I mean, I believe that. And uh, I've seen so many examples of people trying to portray themselves as one thing. And then in the ring, you see who they really are. Or even when they're trying to portray themselves as one thing and they're winning, the crowd at times we'll see who they really are and still hate them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. and it's like, but I said all the good things. Yeah. Bro, it don't work that way. Yeah, but speaking of Fedor, if we take you out of the picture, mm. who are the greatest mixed martial arts uh, fighters of all time? Uh, I, I feel- You out of the picture. As a cop out to some degree, I feel like we need a little bit more time you know, so to, to, to see how, how this unfolds, because you got to compare a lot of things. And I, uh, did I, did I, I think I'm like I did centuries. An inter- I did an interview. <laughs> I don't know about centuries, but that would help if we can keep accurate records and, and not allow, uh, too much, uh, bias to, to, fa- to fall in too much propaganda. The yeah, the good story, luck, right? yeah. But, um, I made an argument. Uh, I was in an, I, I get a, it was, it was, a interview with an MMA outlet of some sort, and I can't recall who it was, but, oh, it was an argument about, will the winner of Cain Velasquez versus Stipe Miocic be the greatest MMA heavyweight of all time? And I said, fucking no way. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it was Cormier and Miocic. That's what it was. I said, absolutely not, not even close. And I said, these guys need a bit more time to see how things go and also how things go for some of their opponents. And like, there's, there's more factors than just this one fight. It really is. And I go, and when you want to weigh these people, even if let's say we'll bring Alistair or, uh, yeah, Alistair Overeem into the, into the equation. Okay. You judge him on what you know now, what he's done for you lately. Okay. 
Right. Which is a, a very myopic way of doing it. Yeah. What has he done over his career? K1 champion. Uh, he was a champion in uh, uh, Dream. Um, he strike force, blah, blah, blah. His overall record, the entirety of all the, the different opponents he's fought. And I just sit back and I go, I, okay, he's not the UFC champ, but his accolades, his merits, in some ways actually stand up higher than Cormier's and Miocic is. So what about the moments, do you give much value to the special moments, like the highest heights you rise to, not in terms of records mm -hmm. or the strikes landed, but just creating a magical moment in, in, a, in, a, in a fight. It doesn't have to be even a championship fight, but just, you know, Conor McGregor yes. is an example of somebody who creates a narrative, who creates mm -hmm. a story, who creates a mm -hmm. drama, and the special magic happens, even if it's like not myth, with- like Myth Nadine. is greater than reality. And that is always the case. But do, do you- And so I understand that so very much. And it takes an asshole like me to to poo-poo on your myth. Yeah. They at least get you, at the end of the day, you're not going to abandon your myth, but um, perhaps temper it with the facts and logic. <laughs> but uh, So but, you're not a fan of myth? No, I'm an absolute massive fan of myth. But you, you know, prefer facts and logic. It's like, it's like when I, no, I mean, it, they, they, <laughs> I, I like saying facts and logic because people, I also- I am not a materialist in that sense. I don't think that materialism can solve for everything. It's not enough. It's not It's not robust enough. I'm sorry. If facts and logic and or uh, reason, as the Enlightenment scholars all thought, uh, including Marx, was enough for people, yeah. then we would never, we wouldn't have any religions. Yeah. We wouldn't have any, uh, like there would be no, we wouldn't have narratives and myths and all this kind of stuff. It would yeah. not, it just, I'm sorry. There is no, there's nothing about history that supports the idea that, rationality will over will, yeah, the, will overcome all there's something about ben shapiro's facts don't care about your feelings that feels to be miss feels to be <laughs> missing something fundamental about human nature it's not clear to me well, he, ex exactly what is missing to give old old, 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 old ben, old, old, old ben <laughs> uh, a fair shake yeah. and uh you know i don't know ben shapiro i don't really listen to ben shapiro not against ben shapiro um i don't I'm not here to say anything particularly bad about him. Uh, although I will say at one time, Tom Arnold was seemingly trying to pick an actual fight with Ben Shapiro. In the ring. A, he, uh, or in somewhere, a, yeah. Just, and I just, and I actually responded like, are, and I tried to get him to clarify, say, hey, are you saying that you want to fight Ben Shapiro? That you're looking to actually, because I was waiting for him to say something and then I can be like, okay, well, it's one thing to want to get into a fight with someone. It's another thing to go pick on a little tiny you know, guy like Ben, who's much smaller than you and doesn't train or whatever. But you know, if it's not me, I can find someone your size and you can go fight him. Yeah. You know, don't be a, basically don't be a bully piece of shit. Yeah. You know, it, which by the way, Tom Arnold, you are a mental midget. You are never going to be able to compete even with Ben Shapiro in an argument on any level about anything. Oh, intellectual argument. Yeah. yeah, yeah. An intellectual argument. You can, maybe you can scream louder than him, but whatever. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, in the discussion of greatness in fighting, I think you you need to look at numbers. Some of the, you so need to look numbers, at some of the numbers, and there's the magic. There is some the context also in that. Where did Alistair Overeem fight? Oh, he fought in Pride, where you could soccer kick people and stomp their heads and this and that. And so the 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 game environment is actually different too. There's so, more uncertainty. There's more chaos right. and pride. There's more. Go back a little further and go like, what about the guys that used to like Dan Severn fought bare knuckle, head yeah. butts, the whole nine. You did, beat Dan Severn, right? I did beat Dan Severn. That was that was killing an idol, so to speak. Although I didn't really kill him because I still love him. <laughs> you know, he's still an I. I mean, he's still responsible for inspiration along this whole pathway. You know, yeah. it's it's meeting meeting your God and then. <laughs> Putting a knife in it, I guess. Make, <laughs> uh, realizing they're human and then uh, bringing them down well, to your level. Exactly, but also uh, there's a there's a huge misconception there, and that is that I could bring maybe I could bring Dan Severn down to my level, but I couldn't bring his mustache down to my level. Uh, oh, it so is it is of mythic proportions and uh, greater than yours. I Great, your facial you know, hair is greater than yours. My facial hair is 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 creating its own legacy, but it is not Dan Severn mustache level or now 
Don Fry mustache. So Don Fry mustache, Dan Severn mustache. You know, now you have like Shia versus Sunni. Like, right. <laughs> do you think there will be a uh, Karl Marx uh, like painting of Josh Barnett one day with the beard? And is that is that basically what you're? I hope so. For? I'll I will actually comb my hair, unlike Marx. But uh, um, Ch chaos is. Uh, has a charm to it it so does it does i mean uh we all thought doc brown in back to the future was was quite charming so you have, uh, to, you have to throw that into the calculation where they fought yes I mean, this is the and how, the rules that they fought under you know some guy like eager vov chanchin won a 32 man tournament or something like that i go okay uh stipe and daniel cormier are awesome and they may they will they will for sure be uh revered as when they're as for their careers 100 percent can you say that they're particularly even better overall than eager of changing well maybe one of them could have beat them maybe maybe one of them wouldn't have you know maybe maybe eager would have fucking got them with the knuckles right away well maybe if they fought him in pride they wouldn't have won maybe if they fought him bare knuckle they wouldn't won i don't know and you there's know? something about the chaos like do you put who is gracie in the top 10 you know there's something Boys, about uh top 10 of all time in terms of competitors is uh, capable um i don't know i'd have to think about that maybe not but i because put Hoist Gracie as like pyramid level like wow dude what a what an amazing man yeah he's so important absolutely incredibly important but there's something about stepping into uh like fighting another human being mm -hmm. under all the uncertainty that the early mm -hmm. ufc's had mm -hmm. i mean you don't know yep what is going to happen and couple that with not much money yep all of it yes so that the purity of it too there's something about money i mean that i guess yes, shit that, for that yes. capitalist world but that <laughs> ruins the purity of the violence yeah people given the opportunity for yeah yeah well uh, the bigger things get the more i love the fact that that fighting has opened up to such a degree that the career business side of it because i i absolutely distinctly separate the two the business side of it has opened up to give me far more possibilities open way more doors for me than i ever intended it to uh whereas the the athlete side of things has if anything just gotten substantially worse i would say and uh some of this can be some of this is due to all the, the the nature of all games will be learned will be gamed uh without even the rules being broken and once that's figured out you need to make an adjustment no adjustments have been made so the game just appears to be the same game over and over and over and over and over again on ESPN plus on whatever, on whatever, on whatever. It doesn't really matter which night you watch. It's the same game constantly. And that's not because the, the, the athletes are worse or better. It's because they have had that game uh, structure long enough that they figured out what do you do to be to be the most successful at it what is the highest percentage way of approaching it essentially even if you're not thinking of percentages what were the if we take a step back it's really fascinating to think about the early ufcs did you fight dan Severn in the ufc i fought him in super brawl in super Hawaii. brawl so that was in the early early days you're undefeated 2000 uh <laughs> what were those early days let's say of mixed martial arts like do you have let me and, tell you the day of high adventure. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 Yeah, it is. It was so much fun. <laughs> and it, it made you feel absolutely like you were a part of uh, a, a novel, a comic book. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to transcribe my experiences as what I consider a second generation MMA athlete. Except I'm way too sensitive uh to anybody's personal anythings that are not not even to you know i'm not a gossipy person i really do believe that like small people talk about others big people talk about ideas so um but th there's just some stories that just can't you can't tell without telling the whole story and there are so many amazing stories that could be told people being at their best people being at their worst yeah, the whole the whole Michigan. Oh, is there all. something you could 
speak to the chaos of the time? Oh, 100%. Like, well, okay, so we at AMC got uh, connected to somebody that was throwing an event in Nampa, Idaho, and we all piled into this, and uh, Matt Hume's uh, Subaru wagon, and we jammed out, and we left Kirkland, and we headed over to Idaho, only to find out that there was nothing really put in place. It was absolute disrepair and, and chaos. Like they didn't have a ring, they didn't have this. We, I, it was such a bullshit adventure. Mm -hmm. But we were like, well, you know, there's hardly anywhere to fight. It's, it's tough to find these opportunities. So, okay, well, how about this? Whoever is here to fight, and is willing all right well since th there's no venue there's no this whatever we all got gloves we got mouthpieces we'll just go to the park as long as you still get paid <laughs> yeah and so folks were kind of like i don't know about that the guy i was gonna fight was he finally figured that they, they finally he finally gets information on who i actually am and i was undefeated at the time and i'd i think i had fought super brawl 13 and already won that tournament and so he's like yeah, I had no clue. I'm so glad we didn't fight. You would have murdered me. This is, you know, what a setup. Mm -hmm. And eventually Matt had to had to strong arm the guy and get our money that we were supposed to all get and drive back. And because he his whole position was, well, there ain't no fucking way. We drove all the way out here for free. This is on you. You fucked this up. Not my problem. But what is my problem is the lack of cash in my account. So fix it. You know, or um, <laughs> me fighting my first uh, organized fight against an AMC guy on 11 days notice uh, through a connection to an old wrestling coach I had. And I just gathered up with who I, what, all my old martial art, my old martial arts uh, instructor that I had worked with. And we grappled in his uh, apartment. We did tie pads in the park. Uh, I ran a couple miles every day and then, all right, boom, show it up. Won my fight by front choke in two minutes. And then Matt goes, okay, well, hey, you did really great. We'd like you to come back and fight again in the summer. What do you think? Okay. Go back off to university. And then I think, hmm, well, that fight didn't go exactly as how I wanted it to. So I got to find a way to get more experience. I would literally fight people in uh, the university like rec center on the old wrestling mats as they didn't know I had a wrestling team. I would find anyone doing martial arts, anyone talking about getting into street fights, anyone, whatever, and just basically go, oh, you ever watch UFC? Yeah, yeah, that stuff's cool. What do you, what do you think? Oh, man, I'm super into it, man. It's badass. Rad. So would you, would you want to fight? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was way easier picking fights and then it was you know getting a girlfriend <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> uh, just you know path least resistance i think it might be useful for us to uh get some advice from you yeah all right because you've accomplished <laughs> for for the, the journey of a martial artist first if you accomplish some of the greatest accolades mm -hmm. there is in the sport if somebody who's starting out now or like early on in their journey mm -hmm. what advice would you give on how to become a martial artist, a uh, catch wrestler, mm -hmm. a fighter? Uh, well, I mean, really what it comes down to is do it because you love it. Do it f for that reason and that reason alone. Uh, most people that get into this and attempt to make any sort of professional inroads with it, you are not going to be the world champion. Uh, you probably will never even fight for a belt. And you're probably not going to net make money at this. So don't do it for those reasons. Do it for the reason of the passion. Do it for the reason to be the absolute best that you can be, whatever that ends up being. You might at best only be mediocre, but you won't even be mediocre if you don't do it like you really mean it. So the passion look, <clears throat> where, where's the kernel of the passion, would you say? Is it in the learning process itself, the improvement? I think is, it really is, depends on the person, right? I mean, there's some people that really love the 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 fact of, they feel like they're growing, right? So will to power, you know, you're growing, growing stronger, growing better. Um, you know, uh, the idea of, of eliminating weakness. So uh, to which 
uh, I'll quickly define weakness as, as, as like things that weaken you, not like being physically weak. Sure, you could call that weakness, but maybe you're not meant to be a super strong guy. But choosing to be weak is, is really a, a different story other than just like we're all uh, deficient in some way or another. So that's neither here nor there. It's a matter of what you decide to do with it. And that's the difference between strength and weakness, at least the way I look at it. Like strength is choosing regardless of the difficulty to make improvements to strength is even choosing to acknowledge that you, you do lack and accept it and then make a decision of what to do with it. Um, yeah, but there's also, there's a bunch of stuff that just like you said, it's what you're drawn to. There's an honesty to just grappling that it seems more real than anything else you can do. Sure. And, well, that, and, and, and also, that's the that's where the passion and love can yeah, come. Yeah, from. I mean, it's being in an environment hopefully that is as true as possible. Uh it would be would be a sta- a starter. So, it's hard to be a uh, a bullshit person when you're literally trying to tear each other's arms off. Yeah. You know, I, it's, you really sort of see who somebody is. Uh I also feel like you really really get to see somebody who there are a couple instances where you really see who people are. Uh on the mats and in the bedroom. So, uh, <laughs> even the aspect of self betterment, uh, g- growth along a path. I mean, hell, that's part of the, the, de- the, the device of capture for martial arts as a business. Give you a belt, mm-hmm. put a stripe on your belt. Each, yeah. each, each of these iterations cost 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. So, you but know, th- there's the, a benefit to that too. I, I I really enjoyed the progression of belts. Sure, it, um, you know, a, a bit of it is OCD or whatever. But you're enjoying the recognition of your your growth when you feel when you're made to feel when I think genuinely you do earn it. Yeah, I and agree. That process, I agree. And I, and I, I actually, it makes complete sense to me. It just it's anything that is is has a a goodness and its purity can also have a detriment in its perversion. So. <laughs> And there's a value to competition. I've gotten some shit in the past for saying this. I, I've gotten the most value in giving everything uh, I have to try to win and and lose. Mm. So like I've gotten, I remember most of the matches I've lost and I think that's what I've gotten the most from the sport is losing. Well, think about <laughs> it. I mean, if you really think about it, um, what what makes you want to actually in detail go over what happened oh it's the time when you didn't get what you wanted yeah it's a time when you gave it everything you had and you came up short right. or failed miserably okay so especially if you're embarrassed in some way right and so that's usually the only time people again calamity is the impetus for them to actually turn around and go who the fuck am i what am i doing and why am i doing it yeah instead of naturally going Hmm. Okay. Well, I won. Why? What was it that caused? And so I think part of my success is that when I win, I'm brutal. When I lose, I'm brutal. And there is no in between. So I remember losing uh, the rematch against Noguera. And I still feel like it was a bullshit call. Like, I feel like I won that fight. But my, my opinion is that and this even came up. So one of the coaches in the back was like, oh, you did great. You know, don't feel bad, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I go, no, fuck that. I didn't finish him. I allowed the referees to make a judge a decision that I think is incorrect and bad. But that came because I didn't take him out. You know, fuck that. No, no, he won. He's going to get more money. He's going to get more recognition, blah, 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 blah. I accept all this and I don't, and it's not okay. And uh, I need to if I, when I get a chance to fight him again, I got to figure out how to way to like take this guy out. I don't want to say forever. I'm not trying to put him six feet underground. Well, when I fight, yes, I am. But, yeah. but that, the, but the, the point being, I need to find a way to, to like, this is definitive. You don't get to say shit about it because I'm the only one who can stand right now. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's got to be. Anything less than that is not good enough. And even if I achieve that, then I got to figure out, okay, it's not a given. How did I get to this point? How did I make that happen? Was it simply been, uh, because of his own mistakes or was it because of my 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 successful action? So it's always it? self-critical. Always, <laughs> constantly. You uh, love movies. Mm-hmm. I read this somewhere. Yeah. 
You mentioned Blade Runner as a favorite. Number one of all time, the, the final cut. That's my go-to. So you would say uh, Blade Runner is the greatest movie of all time? It's one of the greatest movies of all time. And what's, it is what's my in, What's number, in the top? My, what's, what's, my top five, uh, Blade Runner, Final Cut. This is the original Blade Runner. And I used to own, on tape, the original VHS cut. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and I had the director's cut on DVD. Why Blade Runner, by the way? What, what As a kid, I just thought it was so cool. There was something about it that really spoke to me. The whole cyberpunk landscapes and uh, you know, this guy chasing down rogue uh, androids, replicants. And is all it this. Uh, is it just the entire cyberpunk uh, universe, well, I, or I, is it just it, robots as well? No, it's it's. I mean, the cyberpunk universe is part of it. Uh, on the on the surface, I have a, a I've always tended towards dark subject matter, uh, like things that are of the dark, so to speak, are things that I've always been gravitated towards. Mm -hmm. I think maybe part of it is that the things that are darker are more accepting and more upfront with death. Yeah. And perhaps I think that maybe that is what was- uh, Yeah, somehow more honest, all, perhaps. And there's also the aspect of uh, rebelliousness usually. Like there was, uh, I was never one to want to just do what somebody told me to do. You know, um, I'm not sitting around trying to always be such a radical individual that I, I can't, take orders no in fact i'm more than willing to take orders from somebody that i feel is competent and has merit and reason behind what they're doing and it makes like okay yeah yeah, yeah. i'm 100 percent for it. not only will can i take orders i will help you achieve whatever it is if i think it's worthwhile um even at my own expense but uh to get to that point is a rarity like it's just not not a given and so you can even imagine like being a grade school teacher and this kid doesn't respect you and he doesn't really think you're that smart <laughs> they don't really appreciate that but um so cyberpunk is number one what else is cyberpunk there? is kind of number one it's a it's an environment i love but at the same time conan the barbarian by john millius <laughs> is one of my favorite films of all time uh and you know that's such a pure film in a way like the motivations are pure they're very easy to follow but not lacking in depth you know it's not it's not just explosions and and teal and orange it's uh it's it's more on the human condition and i love it and it's shot incredibly well it's got an incredible soundtrack yeah i fucking love it but with blade runner also in a deeper sense you know again the human condition you know you start seeing like what what is what is being what is being human uh, mm -hmm. you know how does this relate to well, if you can make it and you can tell it what to do at what point is it like you should or you shouldn't you know why do you get to determine what's alive and what's not what's a life that should be allowed to live and what isn't and what would be the strain of being roy batty and seeing all these incredible moments that with his passing will no longer exist especially if he hasn't had a chance to put that flame into another torch, so to speak, if he hasn't written them down, if he hasn't passed them down to somebody else. It, it gone like tears in the rain. Like tears in the rain, that scene is incredible. Uh, I mean, but it's funny because those two universes are very different, according to the Barbarian and mm -hmm. Cyberpunk. Is there, that makes me curious about what else might be in the list at the top. <laughs> uh, well, let me think, I and mean, it's a pretty, do you like, like the there, Godfather there, there, there is type a, of universe? No, no. I mean, I'm sure the Godfather. I've never actually even watched the whole Godfather. No, but also like, uh, uh, was it like, Casino, Goodfellas? Goodfellas all is a good movie, but no, that's not in my top. It's it's a good flick, uh, but it doesn't really do it for me. Uh, I, if people really want to get into this a little more, I did make a hundred, a list of a hundred, hundred of my favorite movies on okay. my Facebook fan page. Nice. Uh, but uh, do you remember what, like some, some? Oh yeah, like Blazing Saddles is on there. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, uh, Valhalla Rising by Nicholas from Winding Refn, uh, uh, Maniac by uh, William Lustig. Uh, it's a 1980 gnarly video nasty horror movie mm. about a serial killer uh, who murders women and scalps them. <laughs> Uh, and it's gnarly as hell and very brutal and very bleak and very, uh, 
Um, I mean, it's the kind of thing that like a lot of people would have a real hard time watching. But uh, one, again, I like things that are dark. But two, I thought the performances were fantastic in this film and they really got out the, I think what the underlying thing was, and it was, you know, the, it was a guy who was basically just like run amok by the overbearing mother, uh, Jungian archetype. And it, she was, she imparted her insanity into him and he, but yet there is this aspect you could see of him, of him wanting to try and actually be able to be in the world and have love and have, uh, uh, feminine, companionship to go with with his masculine aspect but he had no way of understanding how to really make that happen and he had a complete negative connotation to the feminine so it's his struggle with and there's a little part in the in the movie where he somehow comes across this model or something and they actually he starts to feel like maybe he might be able to actually have a relationship with somebody and it goes somewhere. But uh, yeah, uh, even the Elijah Wood remake I felt was really well done and captured most of the essence of what the movie was about. But I still feel like the original by William Lustig uh, is the best. What's the greatest uh, love movie of all time? Greatest love movie of all time. So like something where love is, I mean, I suppose love underlies most of these movies, and especially if you like the dark. I mean, hell, Takashi Miike's films are all about family, <laughs> of all things. Yeah. As bonkers as those movies are, they the general theme is family almost entirely in all of his films. Uh, yeah, there's there's very. I mean, even you can argue Blade Runner. Yeah, there, the it's, greatest, it's, it's everywhere. Greatest love film of all time. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, is Excalibur a film about love? Uh, what's Excalibur about? King Arthur. Excalibur is about uh, Arthur uh, becoming king of the Britons and his love of his, his country and his love of Guinevere. But eventually, yeah, it becomes more of about um, the the necessity for the king to love, to to hold, hold Excalibur, to stay, to, to realize that while if you're the king, you can love your wife and you can love your best friend and they may f fuck each other behind your back and as they fall in love too but at the end of the day your responsibility your your love has to be to the to, to the country and everyone else first and not your own personal uh wants which you know well, made, made a much more interesting story when you have uh carmen barina and and <laughs> Or was it, or, oh, oh, what is that one? It's it's a German opera, but, uh, you know, and horses and slow-mo and sword fights and an epic death scene between uh, Arthur and his, his son. Okay, now I definitely have to watch it and I haven't watched it and embarrassed. Uh, it's, uh, it is John Borman's second film in Hollywood. His first one being uh, Point Blank with Lee Marvin, which is also on top, uh, one of the upper echelon movies on my list. Uh, derived from a book by called The Outfit by uh, what is his name? Uh, I forget, but Darwin Cook, the um, comics illustrator, he did Donald Westlake wrote. So Darwin Cook does does an amazing comic book send up of Darwin Cook's novels, and they are fucking incredible. So, anyways, but uh, the Point Blank with Lee Marvin, uh, you know, it's a man driven by purpose revenge but also by like really pure motivations he wants his money he was he was betrayed he, uh, and he wants his his cash because this is what he agreed to do the thing for and this is which also is part of the reason why i like no country for old men so much which i felt was a, great, a movie. great great movie even better book but uh i remember talking to my friend and i go you know anton chigger is the most pure human being in that whole book like, well that guy's the villain i go Haha. is he evil like, yeah. he's the one he lies to no one he does everything he says he will do he always follows his word and on the rare occasion he, he allows fate to make a decision as he figures like well whatever all led us to here will will we'll, we'll lead us one way or the other and if we're at this crossroads what how is there any better or worse way than to do it over a coin flip and so that whole scene where the guy is going, 
well, what am I putting up? And he goes, everything. You've been putting it up every day of your life. And that's true. Everything we do is a, is a, is a, is a decision, is a calling, is a, is a choice. And and, toward, and then it bummed me out that they they reduced the last interaction between Chigger and uh, what's-his-face's wife. And he finally finds her. And she's like, you don't have to do this. And she's, he's like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> this is the way it is. You can think that your life could have turned out any sort of way. You could have done this, you could have done that. But the reality is this is the way your life is. And it's the way it was always going to be. You know, the fact that I'm here is, is the end of it. And that's that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. If you're honest, this is what dark movies reveal, that the villains are the, the purest of humans and uh, can teach us the most like profound lessons. And that's, that's certainly an uh, example of it. What do you think the big ridiculous last philosophical question, what do you think is the, the meaning of this whole thing we've got going on of life and existence on earth from your individual perspective, but the entirety of the human species? Life, uh, the universe and everything? Yeah. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> We could just leave it at that. You knew exactly where I was going. <laughs> I love it. Josh, I love you very much. You've been a huge inspiration. I have a, a friend who she said, do you know Lex Friedman? Have you gone on Lex's con? And I go, yes, I know. I know who Lex Friedman is. Uh, I've sadly been way too long in contact without making it happen for too long. And uh, and yes, I will 100%. Uh, I even cut a shirt at the beginning of the pandemic to make my own little mask at one point yeah. due to the the Lex process. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I love it. I Joe's like, it. I can't really hear you, like, but I'm demonstrating. <laughs> <laughs> Just let's see it through. But uh, no, this has been a blast. And, and next I time, come back. Next time, let's drink some of the, the Warbringer whiskey. I will bring some Warmaster. Uh, I wasn't sure if you were, uh, if you imbibed at all in spirits 100 percent. It, it felt a little weird to do it early on in the morning especially because i'm flying does it though there. does it th i mean i've had some wonderful morning whiskey at times it it uh now that you've mentioned it it doesn't at all so next time let's make sure what joe organ calls the uh adult beverages hmm. let's uh make sure we indulge i have zero reservations for doing such a thing i'm into it josh thanks for talking today ah, my pleasure Thanks for listening to this conversation with Josh Barnett. And thank you to our sponsors, Monk Pack, Low Carb Snacks, Element Electrolyte Drink, Eight Sleep Self-Cooling Mattress, and Rev Transcription and Captioning Service. Click the sponsor links to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Sun Tzu in The Art of War. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.